If you got a Bible, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, we're verse by verse through the book of 1 John. For those of you that didn't grow up in church like I did, you're like, okay, is, is, is 1 John the same guy that wrote the gospel of John? Yes, same guy. Also wrote the book of Revelation. By the time he writes 1 John, he's about 94 years old. Listen, I hope the Lord allows me to live long enough to be 94, speak with no filter, don't have to be politically correct. You can post anything you want to post on Facebook and be like, what you gonna say? I'm 94. I got ties older than you. You know what I'm saying? So, but when we think about what the Apostle John is doing, he's like, hey, listen, my life's coming to an end. I wanna say some things to you. One of the things that he wants to remind us of today through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God is that you can know that you know that you know that when you die, you go to heaven. You can know that. 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things you may know you have eternal life. It's the key verse for our, our, our book study. The beauty of going through 1 John verse by verse is we don't get to skip over verses. For those of you that were with us during our Revelation series, there's a powerful reality when we have to cover every verse because the hard verses we have to deal with, and we'll deal with that today. But I wanna just give you four principles. We'll work through this quickly today. I wanna be mindful of your time. But as we work through these verses, I want to begin in verse one. The Bible says, my little children, he's 94, by the way, so everybody's a kid. I'm writing these things that you may know that you may not, excuse me, to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Now, point number one, write this down. I want you to see the establishment, the establishment, one more time, the establishment of our salvation. The firm foundation of our salvation is not on your works, your deeds, your good merits, your achievements, your accomplishments, not your good outweighing the bad. The establishment, the firm foundation, the pillar of our faith is not religion. It's not checking boxes, jumping through hoops. The establishment of our faith is in grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. He's the only way to heaven. Now, you understand 2022, this, this is actually politically incorrect to say that there's not many ways to heaven. There's one way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Not a way, not a truth, a life. The way, the truth, the life. John 17, three says, and this is eternal life, knowing God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. First John 5, 12 would say, whoever has the son, has life, you don't got the son, you ain't got life. And what I'm saying today is not adding Jesus to a buffet bar of religion, because I've been around enough religious people that will go, I, I believe in Jesus and I believe in this, and there are 300,000 gods a part of one particular religion, and they just add Jesus to it. No, no, this is not adding Jesus to anything. It's Christ alone, your faith and hope in Jesus alone to get to heaven. And so the Bible says, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And this is the target statement. The target statement is, is that we're not sinless. Not a single person in this room is sinless. But because we have grace and because we have mercy and because we have forgiveness, we are called to sin less. Sin less. We're not sinless, but we're called to sin less. Why is that important? Because 1 John 1, 9, Pastor Hutch, who did a phenomenal job. Can we just show some love to Pastor Hutch? He just did an incredible job. Amazing word. But one of those verses was 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's a great verse to memorize. He has forgiven us of all our sin. But we have forgiveness of all our sin, but that does not afford us to have a license to sin. Does that make sense? That because we have forgiveness doesn't mean I can just live however I want to live. Here's what I want to say to you today. As a matter of fact, this has already been posted on Instagram. I saw that somebody already tagged this, and I just want to say this to you. We can't say we got heaven and live like hell. You're like, ooh, that, that came in a little hot right there. All right, that, that, that had a little Tabasco on it. All right, little, little jalapeno right there. That's that little ghost pepper right there. That's, that's got a little, that's, that's hot. Yes, listen to me. Because I meet a lot of people that, that cl watch this, claim they got heaven, but they live like hell. And then I meet a bunch of people like you and me that are trying to live for God, try to be obedient to God, and wonder if we're doing it right and wonder if we're gonna get to heaven. 
You ever been around somebody who's got so much confidence they're going to heaven, but they don't even live like they got heaven? Going to heaven, complete confidence, assurance. Don't even check up. Going to heaven, but live like hell. And then the rest of us are going, I got heaven, but I, don't, I just don't know. We're trying to do the right thing, and we don't live with confidence, and we don't live with assurance. And God goes, can we just correct that today? Can you be corrected? Could I be corrected that there is an assurance that I did nothing to earn this relationship with God? I did nothing to earn my salvation with God. I did nothing to somehow merit. God God didn't look at me and go, man, he's doing really well. Let's give him salvation. Because many of us have heard this analogy in regards to the good outweighing the bad, but but it's such a It's such a bad analogy because we think that if the good outweighs the bad, that because I got more good than bad, I can get into heaven. But we have a misnomer or misunderstanding of heaven. That you understand this. No bad gets into heaven. You're like, Ed, what's the bad? Sin. So no sin gets into heaven. You know, like heaven's perfect. Heaven's sinless. So if we live with this mentality of my good outweighs the bad, then this idea of like, I could earn my way to heaven if the good outweighs the bad. The problem is we got bad. All of us got bad. Romans 3.10, none righteous. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. And so the apostle John goes, hey, listen, I wanna write these things to you so that you may not sin, but if you do sin, which by the way, you will, and I will, we have an advocate. Not only do we have an advocate, we have acceptance. He's the righteous one. And then also the word propitiation, the atonement of our sin. He is the propitiation of our sin, not only our sin, but the sin of the whole world. Now watch this. Let me just see if I can just take these three descriptors of who Jesus is. Our advocate, our acceptance, and he is our atonement. Let me break this down to you. The word advocate means he is our defense attorney. Defense attorney. Now, you've seen those commercials. We've all seen these commercials of these major law firms call the number. They'll represent you. They'll win you this amount of money. Can I just make the, the obvious to you? Whatever that law firm is, that person that's in the commercial most likely is not showing up at your court case. You, you know that, right? Like, you, you know that the guy or the gal that's in the commercial and it's their law firm, they're most likely not going to show up and defend you. They're going to send an associate. That's who they're sending under the banner of the law firm. But the reason why I want to just say this to you, that Jesus is our advocate, our defense attorney, is because he treats us as if we are his only client and he represents us. It's not he sent Gabriel. He didn't send Michael. He didn't send another angel. No, Jesus goes, I'll show up. And I'm going to defend him or her. And he goes before the judge, God Almighty, that demands perfection. And he goes, watch this, as our defense attorney, a little bit different than Hollywood, Jesus, as our lawyer, defense attorney, goes, yep, she's guilty. He's guilty. Because you know this, like in Hollywood and TV shows and programs, the defense attorney goes, my client is not guilty. But instead, we're looking at Jesus, and Jesus is going, no, no. God the Father, like, she's guilty. And we're like, yeah, he's right, Jesus. I, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty, and God, I'm guilty. And so we agree that we're guilty. Now watch this. Jesus goes, she's guilty. He's guilty. They have admitted it. We got video evidence. We know they're guilty. There's, there, there's so much to convict them, and they, they know. They've acknowledged they're guilty. And Jesus goes, I know they're guilty, but because I'm the righteous one, the sinless one, I want to do something. I I don't want to just defend them. I want to take their place and take their punishment from them, which means that God's expectation is perfection. And if we cannot achieve perfection, then the wrath of God called hell is our final destination. And Jesus takes our sin, past, present, and future, goes to the cross, and all of God's wrath, all of God's wrath, of hell poured out on Jesus and Jesus upon the cross. And don't you miss this. The cross of Calvary, the nails that had Jesus on that cross were not powerful to keep him there. He stayed there. He chose to stay there. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says, for the joy that was set before him endured 
the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, right here, right now. So watch this. Jesus goes, I'm your advocate, but the way I'm your advocate is to go, you're guilty. And we go, yeah, Jesus, you're right, I'm guilty. God, I'm guilty, I'm hopeless. But Jesus goes, I'm your advocate, I'm your defense attorney. Not only do I represent you, I'll actually pay the punishment for the crime you committed. And he satisfies the wrath of God by becoming propitiation. You go, Ed, propitiation, what does that mean? Satisfaction. So what's the standard? What is the expectation for the crime? Death. You're like, Ed, that, that's pretty costly. To, like, when I sin, death is the crime or the punishment for the crime? Yes. Separate from God. But God so loves you. He put forth Jesus to die for you, to absorb the full wrath, comes back from the dead, satisfies the wrath of God, and here's the truth of the matter. Based upon that, my salvation has nothing to do with me earning it, but just looking at Jesus going, you're willing to do that for me? Whosoever calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be be saved. Not if, not but, not maybe, not a hope so. If you go, I'm guilty. The verdict is guilty. I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven on my own. But Jesus, you're willing to be my advocate. You're willing to pay the price for my sin. You died for me. You came back from the dead for me. And if I put my faith and trust in you, it satisfies the wrath of God. You go, I say yes to Jesus. Which, by the way, when you say, if Jesus is the only way, why is he the only way? You tell me anybody else that was willing to do that for you. You tell me anybody else that was willing to do that for you. No religion. They'll put up some leader. They'll put up some great teacher that was just as sinful as us. But Jesus knew no sin. He dies for sinners so that we can be made not guilty. Can we clap to that today? That'd be all right. Not guilty. That's our verdict. Not guilty. It's a young lady that gets a speeding ticket. Come on, you know you've been there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 201 Poplar, it's a place in Memphis, Tennessee. She's gotta show up. She's gotta say here and present. She gets some consultation from her friend. She's a college-age student, so she's scared to death. She shows up in this space, 200 people in the courtroom. She's gotta say here or present and just plead guilty. And then she's gotta go to driving school, get the certificate, present it before whoever it needs to be presented to so her insurance doesn't get obviously skyrocketed, and many of us have done that. And so she shows up, she's so nervous, her name is called, the judge calls, us, calls her name, it's roll call. Instead of saying here or present, she shouts out in front of a couple hundred people, guilty. Are you with me? Judge is just asking, who's here today? Goes through roll call, her name is called. Instead of saying here, she goes, guilty! <laughs> okay, right word, wrong time, all right? This was just, are you here and then there's another moment where you get to come before the judge and the judge will call you and go, how do you plead? And then you go guilty. So instead of saying here, she screamed guilty. At that moment, it was like kindergarten class. Come on, high five me, sis. Oh, you about to hand me money? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I don't take the money. All right, but I love you, Jays. All right, so I'm sorry. I got really weird. Just throw it on the table. Yes. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> Some of you, you've heard me say, like, I'm really socially awkward one-on-one. You just saw that right there. <laughs> I'm Joseph, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> that was weird. And where did you go? Did you just vanish? Like, did you just, did she leave? Oh, there you are. Right. Tell me your name. One more time. Danielle, you said Danny, okay, Danielle, thank you so much, I'm, I apologize for being weird, all right, so, amazing, all right, yeah, <laughs> thank you, I think that's why you feel sorry for me, all right, you're like, that guy, we gotta pray for that guy, man, that guy, man, he's a mess, so all of a sudden, she says guilty, so the judge starts laughing, 
She doesn't know it. She's embarrassed. She's crying. And then all of a sudden, the judge leans into the microphone and is like, hey, um, so-and-so approach the bench. So she's walking. She thinks she's about to get arrested. She's like, what is going on? She's sobbing uncontrollably. The judge looks at her and says this in front of a couple hundred people. He goes, in all my years of court of law, I've never seen this before. And she's like, oh, it's that bad, right? So, <laughs> and he goes, and based upon your passion of how guilty you are, I'm gonna dismiss your ticket from the court of law as if it never happened. Now, all you ladies in the room, cry, let the mascara flow. <laughs> Do every, especially all you daughters of dads like me with three daughters and you, and you don't want your daddy's insurance to go up because he's paying for everything right now. Boo snot slobber. That's what you need to do. But all you fellas in the room, you're going to driving school, just like me. That's how that worked. I promise you. No grace for the fellas in the room. But here's what I want to say to you. When we approach the throne and we just go, God, I'm guilty. God does, listen to me. When we go, I'm guilty, I trust in Jesus. God goes, good enough. Not guilty. You go, Ed, it's that easy? I don't have to earn it. See, if you can earn it, then you can lose it. But when it's given, we have such a good God that doesn't go, oh, you messed up? I'll take it back from you. See, if you pay attention to what I'm saying to you, when Jesus moves in, he doesn't move out. That, that's, that's, that's who our God is. When he moves in, he doesn't move out. Number two, write this down. We see the establishment of our salvation. We see the evidence of our salvation. Now, now verses three, four, and five. Let me read this to you. Verses three, four, and five. It goes on to say, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, has a relationship with him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, when you and I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, test yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. My, my kids are in the room today, a couple of my kids, two, two of our, our, I'm trying to see if we got any other kids in the room, right? We got two of, of our four kids in the room. But we've had these conversations with my own children. I'm like, Daddy, how do I know if I'm a Christian? So let's just assume me and you are having a conversation. You're like, Pastor Ed, how do I know if I'm a Christian? There, there are four f phrases I put in your notes. Faith in Jesus, application of scripture, change by sanctification, testimony of surrender. You're like, Ed, okay, how do I know based upon that? Has there been a decision that you have accepted Jesus? It says in verse number three, whoever says, I know him. You go, and I, I believe in Jesus. And, and I would say this kindly, the demons believe in Jesus. So it's not just intellectual head knowledge. It means has there been a decision in your life that you have called upon the name of the Lord? When you look back at your life, has there been a time where you said, Jesus, save me? You go, yes, I've done that before. Two, when you look at the word of God, according to verse four, the Bible says this to us, that we would keep his commandments. That's verse five, actually. Keep his commandments. So you go, Ed, I've made a decision to give my life to Jesus. Is there a desire in your heart to obey God's word? You're like, Ed, there's a lot of days I disobey God's word. Me too. But is there a desire in your heart to read your Bible, to do what it says? You go, Ed, yes. Yes. Are there times you read the book of Leviticus and go, I have no idea what it's saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but is there a desire in your heart to go, I want to do what God says? And you go, yeah. It's another evidence you're a Christian. So it's not just a decision. It's a desire to obey his word. See, if you know him, you'll love him. And if you love him, you'll obey him. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do we get it right all the time? No. But is there a desire in your heart to obey God's word. You go, yes, only God could give you that desire to be obedient to his word. Third dynamic is what we call sanctification. It's the word perfected. Verse five, very end of verse five says, for the love of God is perfected. The word perfected means matured or growth. Here's another way that you can find out whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. Is there a decision? Is there a desire? And is there a distinction, a change in your life? Can you look at your life and go, I'm becoming more mature in my faith. I'm growing in my relationship with God. 
October 17th, 1990, I became a follower of Jesus. I got saved on my 15th birthday. When I say saved, I'm talking about saved from sin, saved from hell, gave my life to Jesus. 15 years old, didn't grow up in church. My mom and dad, true story, in the church parking lot, they said, hey, Ed, um, happy birthday to you, but we're not celebrating your birthday. You've made our life miserable. True story, I about got expelled from middle school, a lot of other stuff. I was a rebel, I was reckless. You, I, I took advantage of my parents because they were deaf. There was a lot of things I am so regretful of. They said, we've called our family. They're not, they're not gonna call you and tell you happy birthday. No cake, no, no gift cards, no presents, nothing. It was like a wake-up call. So they dragged me into this little Baptist church, sitting on the front row, watching the interpreter sign for my parents. I give my life to Jesus. That dude that walked in that little church in Orlando, Florida, is not the same guy that walked out of that church. And it's not, the guy, it's not the same guy that actually is in front of you today. There has been growth. There has been progress. I can look back and go, man, 15 years old, I was still immature. I was a brand new believer, but I've been growing in my relationship with the Lord. It's been a lot of steps forward, but man, sometimes it's been seven steps back. But, but I'm, I'm moving in this direction of, I want my life to count for Jesus. When you look at your life and my life and you look at the totality of your life, there are people that go, I'm a Christian, but they got, they they say this. There's a lot, oh, this just popped in my mind. There's a lot of lip professors and no heart possessors. Hey, can I just say this, this 121 service, Eric, AJ, this needs to be the service we put online because that statement right there. There are a lot of lip professors and no heart possessors. A lot of people say they're Christian. And I've, I've heard some crazy reasons. I've been baptized. That water doesn't wash away your sin. The blood of Jesus washed away your sin. I've heard people say, because I'm a member at a church, having your name on the attendance roll at a church doesn't get you into heaven. When we, when we think about, like, I've heard people say this, I was born in America. But because our nation was a Christian nation, we're, we're post-Christian now, but it was founded upon some Christian principles. Like I was born in America, I'm going to heaven. I've heard people say this, my mom and dad are Christians. I was born into a Christian family. I say this in love, bro, your mom and dad can't save you a seat in heaven. It's a decision you gotta make. But when you and I think about that decision, there should be a desire to be obedient to the word of God. Don't get it right all the time, but there should be a desire If we love God, we should value what he says. And not only only that, but there should be some change, a distinction in my life. I don't talk like I used to. Do I slip up? (laughs) Yeah, way too often. But I know when I slip up, oh, conviction hits me. I, I don't do the things I used to do. I live different. Why do I live different? Because Christ in me. But what is the goal of my life? 1 John 2, 6, if we claim to be in him, we must walk as Jesus walked. You're like, Jesus walked? How did Jesus walk? He walked on water, took five loaves, two fish. That's that's not what we're talking about. What Jesus said over and over and over again, my food is to do the will of the Father, John 4. Not my will, but thine be done. What was the steps of Jesus that we need to follow in? Pleasing to the Father. Can I ask you a question? Do you wanna please God? You go, yeah, Ed. Then these are just four evidences. Decision, desire, distinction, direction. I'll say it again. Have you made a decision to give your life to Jesus? You go, yeah. Is there a desire in your heart to read God's word and obey God's word? We don't always get it right, but is there a desire? You go, yeah. Is there a change in your life? Yeah. Is there a direction in your life? I want to please the Father. Yes. Then based upon the authority of God's word, not Pastor Ed, but based upon the authority of God's word, and only God knows your heart. If that is true, then the Bible that we're reading today goes, you can have the assurance of salvation that you are a son and daughter of God, which means to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So if I die, my soul is going to heaven, not because of me, because it goes back to point number one, the foundation of Christ as my advocate, my acceptance, and my atonement. He is the one that's given me this foundation of salvation. And from that, my vertical relationship with him I could see these things. But point number three, write this down. Not only the evidence of our salvation, we see the examination of our salvation. Now still with me, say amen. Amen. Now watch this. Point number two deals vertically. 
But one of the evidences now leading to the demonstration of our salvation is how we treat other people. How we treat other people. Do we love our neighbor? Now watch what verse seven reveals to us. It says, beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it's a new commandment. Anybody else confused? You're like, which one is it? Ed? Is it an old commandment or a new commandment? It's both. Now watch this. The old commandment is Leviticus 19 verse 18. Love your neighbor. You're like, Ed, we've heard that before. But I want you to listen to this. Old commandment, love God, love your neighbor. Go ahead, we've heard that. But now what's the new commandment? It takes on a different form because Jesus has come to this world and actually walked amongst us and showed us how to love like Jesus loves. That's the new commandment. The old commandment, love your neighbor. But if you're like me, I wanna pick my neighbor. I just wanna love the people who love me. And Jesus goes, the new commandment is that you love people the way that I love people. And you're like, Jesus, you're telling me I gotta pray for those who curse me? I, I gotta bless those who persecute me? You, you, you're telling me, Jesus, I, 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 gotta, I gotta speak a word of positivity over people that speak a word of negativity over me? You're telling me that when someone tells me to go one mile with them, I'll go another mile with them? You're telling me to love my enemies? So you're telling me that I don't just love the people that love me, I'm to love all people and I don't get to pick my neighbor, which means I love people that don't look like me, I love people that don't talk like me, I love people that don't live in the same neighborhood I live in. I am, to, I am called to love all people. If they're for me or against me, my response is love always wins. You go, yes. And when we're consumed with hatred, then the word of God says this to us, in verse 10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. This is what Pastor Hutch talked about. Jesus is the light. And in him, there is no cause for stumbling because we have the light. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, watch this. Are there gonna be moments in your life that you hate people? Yes. Don't you act like you're the bonic believer. There are going to be moments you, you, you get frustrated with people, you get disappointed with people, you get angered with people. You actually could even go, I hate somebody. But here's what happens. When you and I have the light in us, that doesn't last for a long time because the Spirit of God starts working on you. And you go, God, are you telling me that what I'm feeling right now, I, I can't keep doing that? No. That the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, through the light of God is going, no, you got to respond differently. You're like, but they wronged me. They victimized me. They took advantage of me. And all those things are true. And we want justice. And we long for justice on this side of heaven. So please don't understand what I'm saying. We don't excuse things that are illegal or immoral. All right? So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But at the same time, we go, but I've been longing for them to say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And that has not come. And so you forgive them, though they have not asked for forgiveness because you wanna be set free. And why would you do that? Because Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So Jesus becomes the example. So the vertical relationship we have with God now gets manifested in the horizontal relationship with God, which is why John 13, let's say this in verse 34 and 35, they will know you are my disciples by your what? Love one for another. Not just the people that we have relationship with, but even sometimes the people that hurt us. Here's the reason why. Because love is to be unconditional. And that's hard. Because that, only, that kind of love only comes from God. But when we make a mess of it or make a mistake in it, here's what happens. We know it and we deal with it. Let me just use some self-deprecation for a second and just let you know that there's moments I blow it. I was traveling. This is several years ago. I was coming out of Memphis on my way to a speaking engagement, and I got to TSA. It was the last flight on a Saturday night. Roller bag, garment bag, backpack. For those of you that have flown before, you're only allowed two carry-ons, two carry-ons. And so I'm in the TSA line. This is the last flight of the night. I got to get there that evening, preach that Saturday or Sunday in the morning. So I'm in line, TSA agent, and I'm not embellishing this. She looked very similar to Medea. True story. And she was sweet to everybody else. 
But I walked up there and all of a sudden I was like, hi, how are you doing? She's, she goes, you need to get out of line, go check one of those bags. I said, ma'am, listen, the, the counter's already closed. It's the last flight of the night. There's nobody, nobody even at the counter. Like I, I'm gonna miss this flight, please. It's just, it's, just, it's just a suit. It's all it is. It's just a suit. She goes, get out of line, check the bag. Have you ever said something, you're like, as soon as it came out, you're like, come back to my mouth. You ever had that moment? Like, <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, no. <laughs> she goes, get out of line, check the back. I go, no. So we're just looking at each other. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I unzip my roller bag and, and I know what you're thinking, because you're way smarter than me. You're like, just consolidate. It, it won't fit. So I just unzip it enough to jam my garment bag into the hole of the zipper. It doesn't fit. Jam it in, zip it from both sides to make it stick to where I could take my hands off it, and it stays. So now it's become one, all right? It's become one. But it's, it's an ugly one, all right? So, and I looked at her, and this is the moment where I was like, just trying to grab words. I was like, are you happy now? So, she does this right here. She's like, because she knows she can't say anything because it's, it's really one. It's not a complete one. It's not even a beautiful one. It's an ugly one, but it's together. So, the lady behind me, she goes through, and we're on our way to the flight. We're kind of walking side by side and she sees my frequent flyer tag and she goes, excuse me, sir, um, what do you do for a living? <laughs> you ever wanted to lie? <laughs> like, I wanted, this is what I wanted to say to her. I was like, I work for AutoZone. I, I work for AutoZone and I sell mufflers and I'm gonna go give a talk on mufflers and catalytic converters and I'd love to tell you more about mufflers. And I looked at her and I was like, I'm a preacher. And, and I'll never forget this. She goes, oh, and it backed up for me. She actually backed up for me. Like lightning was gonna hit me right there in that moment. She was like, if it's gonna hit him, it ain't gonna hit me, I promise. So I get back, it was just a one day trip and the spirit of God speaking in my heart goes, make it right. You ever had a conversation with the Lord like this? She, she's on a different shift, God. She ain't gonna be there. She's like, she, she was night shift. She's not gonna be afternoon shift. She's not gonna, so no, I'm not doing that, God. God's like, no, you need to go make it right. So I, I walk over, you know, kind of that quick glance. She gonna be in TSA, and sure enough, she was standing right there. And I walk up to her. Once more, she looks like Medea. I walk up to her, and I'm, I'm like, oh, ma'am, I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember me from last night, and... She goes, oh, honey child. <laughs> and at that moment, my chin goes to my chest. And like I was seven years old, I was like, I'm so sorry for um, what I said to you last night. And I'm a, I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor and I shouldn't have act, acted that way. And I, I'm so sorry. I was so mean to you. I'm so sorry. And she goes, would you look at me? And I looked at her. And, um, and at that moment, she goes, she goes, I want to just say thank you for apologizing. She goes, real men who love Jesus apologize. And I went. And from that, we became the closest of friends. Like, every time I flew out, I was like, what's up? We'd hug each other. With two bags, it's exactly right. Never made that mistake ever again. But here's what I'll say to you. Are we gonna get this right in vertical relationships? No. But the difference is when you're a follower of God, the Holy Spirit deals with you, the Holy Spirit works on you, and at some point, there's a moment where you go, I gotta make this right. I, I, I gotta figure out how to make this right because the Spirit of God is doing One of the ways we know we're Christians is that when we have relationships horizontal with people and they're not right or they get off or we feel traumatized or victimized, whatever it may be, we have to get to a place of going, God, I wanna be right with you. I wanna be right with this other person. It may not work out. Reconciliation may not happen. I may not get the forgiveness that I'm asking them to, to, to say to me, like, I'm sorry, 
that you go, God, I'm going to control what only I can control. And I'm going to just make myself right before you. I'm going to make myself right with other people. One last point. You'll see this. We see the encouragement of salvation. What's the encouragement? The encouragement, and and just real simply, the encouragement, you'll see it in verse 12. Your sins are forgiven. Verse 13, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Verse 13 and 14, you have overcome the evil one. You go, Ed, I don't get it right. I mess up. Christianity's not perfection, it's pursuing Jesus. But here's what you need to know. Your sin has been forgiven. It doesn't allow you to live however you wanna live. You wake up every day and you want to please the Father. You fall down, you get back up again. And some of you need to understand, here's the encouragement. You're so defeated, so discouraged. You go, can I really know that I'm going to heaven? Yes, you can know that you're going to heaven. You have been forgiven. And not only that, but you have a father. And let me tell you what this means to me because when I read this this week in light of losing my father, there was such encouragement that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. And though I may feel like an orphan, I'm not an orphan. He is my father. And I got family and I may not have biological brothers and sisters, but we got each other. And in the process of this, I know that the word of God says, and you will overcome the evil one. The evil one wants to push you down, hold you down and not let you you walk in victory because the moment you get confidence, the moment you get courage that Jesus Christ is your savior and nothing can change that, then you begin to live in the boldness that God calls you to. Because the enemy wants you to doubt your salvation. The enemy wants to keep you discouraged. The enemy wants to keep you on this yo-yo of like, I feel good today. And then all of a sudden you feel as if like, man, I've blown it and God doesn't love me anymore. His love is fixed on you. And I'll just close with this. My wife and I, when we were living in Memphis, and all these stories kind of go back to Memphis, but when we were living in Memphis, we, we had four children under the age of five, and it was crazy, and I don't, moms and dads, have you ever gotten to the point in your parenting where you just start bribing your kids? You're just like, I'm just gonna bribe you. Like, I gotta figure out how to motivate you. Like, all chaos is breaking out in your home. We had four children under the age of five, and it was just chaos. So my wife put together what's called the sticker chart. Sticker chart. We had our rules on one side of the things that we were asking our kids to do. We had their names and we had to attach to to their names. It's like the day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we had a string attached to it was a Sharpie marker. And at the end of the week, the child with the least amount of checks could go into the treasure box and get whatever they wanted. So our rules, names, day, string, Sharpie. So when one of our kids punched their brother, hit their sister, go to the sticker chart, it's Monday, check, underneath the rule that they broke. End of the week, the child with the least amount of checks, checks are bad, by the way, least amount of checks, wins star of a week. But when we got to the end of the week, we're like, wow, the one who won had 67 checks versus 72, 85, 94. We're like, this, this ain't working, right? So my wife, she got a better idea. She was like, we gotta use positive reinforcement. So she got a sticker box just filled with stickers that was attached to the sticker chart. And anytime we caught you doing something good, you could take a sticker and your checks for the week, you could pick any check and cover it up. So then all of a sudden, our children became very competitive of trying to get stickers, walking around like, God bless you, brother. (laughs) God bless you, sister. Can I make your bed today? (laughs) Can I do the dishes for you today? And so it was just like sticker, 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 sticker. And so all of a sudden, we... Now, there were still 67 checks, but they just kept getting covered up by stickers. And when I was looking at that one day, this is how many people live their life before God. Sticker chart, this is God keeping the sticker chart and he's got his rules. And man, when I break the rules, I I check, 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 check. And it's a lot of checks, but this is how many people live. But if I do a good deed, if if I do a good action, 
I could cover up that X, or excuse me, that check, and I could cover up that check, and I could cover up that check, and cover up that check, and check, check, check. So if I just, I go to church, I read my Bible, I'm kind to someone, I, I give something to someone, I could just cover up all the wrong things I've done by my good works. Do you see how many people live, right? But you go, but that's exhausting. And, and how do we know if we can get enough stickers? How do we get enough stickers to cover up all our wrongs? You go, you can't. But God so loved the world that he sent Jesus one honking huge sticker. And you go, my life is filled with a lot of checks that I can't cover up, but Jesus saved me. And the savior of the world, the sticker of the world just walks right into your life and covers up all the checks. You're like, all of them, he gets them all. There's not a check that's not covered. There's not a check he doesn't get. You and I know the checks are underneath the sticker. Jesus knows they're underneath the sticker. But when God looks at the sticker chart of our life, guess what he sees? No checks. Guess what he sees? Jesus in your life. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a follower of God. Come on, you got to high five me right now. Come on, I'm fired up, yes. And when you and I think about what God has called us to be about, it's Jesus, the sticker of the world, the savior of the world that covers up every check that we have done in wrongdoing and we can be forgiven, sons and daughters, and forever free. Come on, can we clap our hands together today? Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you wanna put your faith and trust in Jesus, today would you call upon his name? Would you say yes to him? Make that decision. Many of you have already done this. You don't have to do it again, but if you're going, Ed, I've never done that. Today is the day. Let's say this out loud to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me, change me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith, all of heaven rejoices, we rejoice. But if you made that decision, would you hold your hand up as tall as you can? Anybody in the room that going, Ed, I did that today. I gave my life to Jesus today, come on. If you see a hand raised, you need to be high-fiving them. You need to be hugging them. Make sure you stop by CBC Cares, get a free Bible, but look right here. Lola, live when I'm dead and gone. In my Bible are notes I've written to you that you're not allowed to read until I'm gone. But inside this Bible, on the front cover of this, not only do I have all my CBC stickers, but names of people that go, Ed, I gave my life to Jesus. And what I do over here in this meet and greet is every weekend when people say, I gave my life to Jesus, I hand them a pen or Tony hands them a pen and they write their names in my Bible. And there are days, there are days that I, I just read names when the enemy beats me down and tells me I'm not good enough. I just read names. I just read names. Chase, Bianca, Carmen, Alyssa, Audrey, Ava, Brooke, Stella, Macy, Jonathan, Casimir, Leah, and I just read names. The reason why I do that is because I want people to know that when you give your life to Jesus, it's more than just putting your name in my Bible, I promise you. It's the fact that when you give your life to Jesus, your name is in a book called the Lamb's Book of Life written with a pen with no eraser on it. It's there. The moment you gave your life to Jesus, he wrote it in the book. It can't be erased. And when you die, you get into heaven because of Jesus and your name's in the book. And based upon that, that's the assurance and the confidence that we have. So my prayer for you is that you would walk out of here in boldness. Are you gonna sin? Yeah, but you got an advocate. Are we gonna make mistakes? Yeah, but we got a defense attorney. Love God. Read his word, do what he says. Let the Holy Spirit of God do the work in your life and let your light shine in such a way that it drives out the darkness. So Father God, we pray and bless your holy name. Allow us to walk in victory today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, let's clap our hands, celebrate God's goodness.
Till we meet again, much love.